Hello and welcome to the second assignment for the beginner drawing course. We're going to be demonstrating how you can work your way through this assignment and have a successful time in learning these shapes and learning how to draw these shapes in various dimensional formats and then finally kind of playing around with figures a little bit and using those measurements we talked about in previous lessons. So. In this first demonstration, I'm just going to start by drawing a bunch of freeform shapes and geometric shapes. So again, freeform shapes kind of take on any shape they really want. So something like that, for example. And then you can find ways to, of course, break that up if you want to do so with ellipses to make it seem volumetric that way. This is something that you'll see in a lot of different drawing books and guides and can be helpful when it comes to creating that dimension you may be seeking. You know, drawing all the way through it, making it seem like it has form. This one still seems rather flat because we kind of created an arbitrary shape here. And then we have to be very careful to try and arc those contours enough to give it that form that we're seeking. You should, you should be fooling your eyes into giving it three-dimensionality. And sometimes that's easier without drawing the unseen side, but it can also help. The unseen side adds a slight bit of complexity that if you're not careful and conscientious will work against you. But in this case, we have more dimensionality than we had before. So we can just run a line through it if we want. And this one looks a little bit more dimensional. These are some freeform shape examples. I'm not going to draw 100 of them for you because that would kind of take a long time for one and it wouldn't be that fun to watch. But here is a cone, more of a conical shape. Again, something that we can put a line through and mark off. Start adding some ellipses. Nice and slow. We're not too worried about line quality at this point. We'll get into that in later lessons. We just want these shapes to be understood and be able to deploy them when we want. You know, things like circles. It's okay if the lines aren't perfect. We just want to make sure that we can draw rough and approximate circles and then draw the great arcs inside of those circles to make sure that they seem dimensional and volumetric. We want to be able to draw our cubes, of course. So we can start with a diagonal line and then close off a square first when we're drawing cubes. And this diagonal line and this diagonal line have to be at pretty much the same angle. These lines have to be pretty parallel, meaning that they will never meet. I mean, these ones aren't exactly perfect because if you take them long enough, they will converge at a vanishing point, but that's assuming camera distortion. We wanna, we wanna go for parallel. So next we're gonna shoot those lines off to the side a little bit and then follow suit with another one. Now you can really only see two of the faces of this cube and there's have, you have to then choose which perspective you're gonna use. So in this case, I'm gonna showcase the bottom face of the cube and then just shade that in a little bit so that we can tell that it's the bottom because there's less light reaching it. And if you want to draw through to the unseen side, we have to locate that as well. So now we can sort of see the top as well as the bottom. It's a little more difficult because we picked a tricky angle for this cube. So one way to circumvent that is to draw it with one of the faces being way more apparent as to where it's going to appear in our viewpoint. And this is a much easier way of showcasing a cube because all three of the faces are much easier to see than here. They have the top face, this face, and this face, the two side faces. It's almost like a dice or a die rather, if we're not talking plural then drawing the unseen side becomes much easier 
even though there's quite a bit of distortion with this particular line, it's just too steep of an angle. I was afraid of hitting my dot, which oftentimes when we create marks, we will sometimes set ourselves up to have problems with some of our shapes because we want to avoid subconsciously hitting bounds and collisions. So sometimes it's best just to keep it line based or to mark off the very end of the line as opposed to have things that are in the middle of it or in the way of it. That's just a small tip, but there's still some slight distortions because we're not using perfect perspective here or anything. We just want to get used to drawing lots and lots of cubes of various types. So I'll just do another quick one as another example because cubes are one of the most fundamental forms we can ever, ever use in drawing. So even if they're not completely regular in, in terms of uh, being a perfect square that's turned into a cube, uh, it's more of a rectangular prism. That's still quite good for understanding how boxes will then allow you to build many things within them and just using them later down the line. So there's plenty to do in the realm of cubes when it comes to your hundred shapes. Next we'll talk about the pyramid, which isn't too different from the cone, but the cone we can start with an ellipse. You know, we can divide it up if we want. Subdivisions always really help when you're understanding your shapes. You understand how to kind of dice them up. And then we can shoot a line off in any direction. And then use that line as a guide to find the other aspects of our cone. And then we can create some cylinders that are retreating back in space. Again, if there's, if there's distortions, just don't worry about it at this point. You can iron them out as you go. It's just about getting these shapes into your visual library and getting your hand comfortable with drawing them. So next we'll do a pyramid. So we can start with a square base, something like that. And then we can, of course, subdivide if we want. And then prop that upward using those subdivisions as a guide and taking all of our lines back to each little corner there. And then we have a humble little pyramid here. You can use those at pretty much any angle you would want to utilize them. So we can follow suit. Do that again over here. And again, knock back some of the lines in terms of their opacity or how thick they are, just to help with that illusion of depth. So we're drawing through the unseen side for that x-ray effect. And we're also drawing on the forms just to make sure that we have that contouring, that arcing, or you know, if you want to subdivide a cube, you can draw across the form like this. It's almost like 3D modeling in two dimensions. So if you don't use perspective guidelines, you're gonna have distortions, but it helps to just keep at the forefront of your mind that you're just trying to learn the shapes. You're not trying to make them perfect. The first couple times you play a scale on an instrument, it's gonna sound choppy, it's gonna sound weird. You just gotta keep doing it. You just go up and down, up and down, cleaning it up as you go, being very conscientious. So thus far, we've drawn on the shapes to show their forms. We've drawn through the shapes to get the unseen side. And last, we're gonna be putting those shapes into figures and squint, it's kind of squinting so we can get new perceptions of each figure and pose. So we kind of did that in lesson one, just as a breakdown or demo example. I'm gonna do it from imagination uh, just for this demo, but I recommend you do use reference for this step. So for example, if I start with a circle, sort of a skull shape, and then I want to combine another circle to finish off my skull shape, we now have a base that we can start using. So let's use a cylinder for the neck, 
And if we really want, we can draw the unseen side here, knock back the opacity a little bit, and then go out into the clavicle or the collarbone with the trapezius muscles. If you want to know more about some of the muscles and breakdowns in a simplified manner, you can always check out the Simple Anatomy for Artists course. If you're watching this demo on YouTube, there's a link to the description box, or you can find it at uh, the Beginner Drawing course Gum Road. So again, it's really helpful to be able to draw on these forms so that we can subdivide them and have measurements for where things are going to go. You know, here are some trapezoids where you might lay some eyes in. Here could be just another line where we might stop the nose and then halfway between that a line where we might create the mouth. And then we have this shoulder girdle here that we've made out of sort of a diamond shape. And your shapes will determine the kind of figure that you draw. So it's good to experiment and do a lot of different figures with a lot of different shapes because we want to learn to combine these shapes. So next we can start off with a kind of rounded rectangle, you know, sort of a pillow or flower sack shape representing the upper part of the torso. And you can break it into two or three pieces. So follow suit one more time, taper it down into what could be the pelvis or the start of the pelvis. We can then kind of draw through it again to get sort of a rough idea of where these shapes are meeting up and kind of fusing a little bit. We can then do some guidelines for the arms. This one's going to be out a little bit far, it'll look strange. And that's why lines are really nice. They can just help you discern where you're going to have the trajectory of the limb. So I know just based on studies and anatomy and other books that I've read, that at the end of the rib cage, which I'll mark off as right here, we're going to have the uh, end of the the beginning of the elbows and the end of the upper arm. So that means that these lines can represent where we're going to start the wrists and end the lower arm. But now we have to go in with some geometry, some shape language for those upper arms and then the lower arms. So of course we're just simplifying things here. We can start with a circle for the shoulder. It's no big deal. Just drop them in some modified circles, elongated circles. And then if we want to get a little more technical, we can kind of break up the bicep into a long sort of deflated football shape. Kind of follow suit there. Then the other part of the arm, you can just draw a line and you can see that we're starting to form shape enclosures very naturally this way. Just basically taking and subdividing a cylinder up into more interesting and slightly more representative shapes, even though we're thinking in abstraction. And then we'll have sort of a diamond with an elongated tail down to the wrist. And again, we'll just take those shapes and draw on the contours so we have a general idea of how those shapes are going to look in terms of their dimensions. Because contours, we don't really have all that information of what's going on inside. Even if we close it off, everything still seems relatively flat. But when you begin to understand how to close it off so that it doesn't look flat, and how to draw all the contours therein, then you can start to have more dimension work its way through your shapes. And that is what gives things a more volumetric appearance. So at that point, you can then begin to have more accurate contours and use lines to represent things more accurately, even if still a bit stylized. So 
that's basically where we're headed throughout the course, just to kind of push forward a little bit. Sort of a rounded rectangle for the thumb. And then of course the two joints in there. And this sort of, this sort of stylization is just kind of a easy way to parse things from memory. Because without reference, you have to have some shorthand for how things are going to be represented or look in the abstract. And you can just see me breaking up all these small shapes into a rough hand. And then there's still the matter of how those shapes are going to connect anatomically, which is still getting a little bit ahead here. But I want to show you just these previews of how these shapes will eventually become more complex and you will be able to understand and do things at this level and higher levels because we're starting with very basic shapes modified cylinders and cubes and circles and spheres and then just getting those to the point where we understand them well enough that we can start to modulate them we can start to add complexity but from the simple is the complexity born. We don't want to start with complexity that we can't properly parse. So I'm just going to quickly lay in some shapes for this figure, some sort of spatula shapes for the hands, and use a small shape to separate the legs there, kind of a softened trapezoid, and the legs I will then use very simple lines with little marks as to where the joints are going to end. I can already tell based on the trajectories that the figure is going to be in balance. This is just an intuitive sense that you get after a while. I can also tell that that's a bit long for the lower leg. So we have to adjust that and I can tell just based on lines at this point. This is already a very stylized figure with very stylized proportions, but for a demonstration of how shapes are going to help us create figures, it works well enough. I'll show you much more applicable ways of doing this, much more believable ways of doing this down the line, because in order for me to draw figures the way I usually draw figures, I have to sort of switch out of teaching mode which in the beginning is not as helpful when you need to understand these basic concepts which don't look as good but have a simplicity to them that makes them graspable and makes it so that you can execute them with a relative amount of certainty versus going all in and going at full speed when we're still learning to kind of walk here. So you can always go back and do more sketchy adjustments, kind of understand the figure from a few different purviews here. This hand will probably be going behind that leg. We want to make sure our shape overlap is something we're thinking of quite a bit. I can push this back with a little bit of shading, of course, and Add a little trapezius muscle. I'm sorry, not trapezius, a lat muscle. Kind of comes around from the back there. Just a visual shorthand to make this basis come together. Very simple shapes for the feet, just wedges. All modifications from shapes we were using before. I'm going to shrink the head just a little bit so my proportions are a little more on point. And then we have this very basic figure, very mannequin-esque. And I'll just change that to a more rounded shoulder so we have a little more symmetry here. Unity with variety and all that good stuff. So now we can go ahead and draw on some of these forms. But you see me just breaking up these shapes, these cylinders, these modified cones, these spheres, 
into a very basic figure. And all of this is to showcase the power of understanding shapes, understanding how to speak in shapes and work with them the same way that we kind of went through in the lesson. So let's double back and start checking out what else we're going to talk about. So applying horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines as a means to, as a means, excuse me, to measure and correct figure proportions. So in this case, where we just sort of did a figure out of our head, we had to rely on proportions that we've sort of memorized. I'm going to quickly grab a reference for a figure and show you how to use lines to break down the proportions of the shapes and what shapes to lay in as a result of that breakdown. All right, now that we have some reference, let's use shapes and measurements to break this down. So one way of measuring is always based on the size of the head. So her head is about this distance, and that means that we can take that measurement, and I'll move it a little bit away from the figure here, and approximate those distances all the way down, which line up nicely with the bricks, and see how many head heights tall the entire drawing is going to be. All right, so now let's count these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about 8.5. So we'll just put 8.5 down there. So after we know how tall the drawing is going to be, we need to know about how wide it's going to be. So again, we can take the measurement of one part and transpose it to the rest. So the widest part is the jacket puffing out right there. And then we end at the next widest point, which is the end of the knee. So let's find out how many head heights tall that is. It approximately looks like it's going to be a little more than three. So I'll just arc this measurement down. It's a little short. We'll try that one more time. A little long and about right. Okay, so we'll arc this measurement down and make similar subdivisions. So it's about three and two thirds long. So however you want to write that we can then use that numerical breakdown and those measurements to inform how we're going to do our drawing. Because we have some concrete, more concrete measurements we can work with. There's still approximations. Nothing is perfect, obviously. We can start to use the size of the head, which we'll just simplify again. And this time I'm going to use much more constructive shapes, meaning they're going to have a, a better feeling of solidity than the previous drawing. And I'm going to do that by borrowing from George Bridgman, who was a fantastic figure drawing artist. So that means a lot of his shapes were much more straight and interlocking. So lots of these types of lines that you see me using here to get the ideas of the sort of architecture of the body. Straight lines can be very helpful because drawing short straight lines in every direction is fairly easy. It's a flick of the wrist or a movement of the elbow and it's just a more convenient way to get a constructive look to the drawing which can really help with understanding and solidification so i'm going to be looking at that drawing and looking at the measurements we took as i do this drawing to the left here for this demonstration
So the head is very circular, but we're going to make a very constructive jawline. Not being afraid to control Z a little bit if we have to. And I want to feel like the forms are interlocking. Meaning they're clicking into one another, like Legos or machine parts, or how the bricks lock into one another. Next, we're going to do this shape right here. And it's very dark and low contrast, so it's kind of tough to tell what the actual makeup of that shape is. So we'll just approximate it again with very constructive shapes. After which, we'll switch to this hood shape right here. And that goes a little something like this. Next, we'll do this little upside down triangle. Kind of lock that in. Then we'll finish off the other side. What we have now is enough to start measuring a little more assiduously. So I'll take this head height, and I know I'm going to want to go down about eight head heights to get to that bottom of the shoe. So I'll just mark that off down there. I know I'm not going to want to go too wide, but that's about as wide as I want to go as well. So we can keep those measurements on a separate layer if we want, or do them very lightly if we're working traditionally. And what I'll do now is I'll just enclose the figure in a picture plane. Move that out a little bit farther. There we go. Pretty straight, but not perfect. So that plane now is easier to break up and measure with. So I know the halfway point at it is right about here. I can start with my head heights right about there. And just send those measurements downwards in rough approximations. So we have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And then we have the measurements that go across, which again are pretty vague. We can subdivide that just to help us have a guideline there. So I'm going to move some of the notes to the right so that we can continue our drawing. And we'll just put those aside for now and proceed. So we should have about three head heights down to reach the elbow. That looks like it's going to be right about here, which means I need to move the drawing to right about here for that same effect. So now I'm going to use those very constructive lines to sort of mark that off looking at all the shapes in there. And just sort of replicating them loosely. Doing those enclosures that we did in our first assignment demo, just to help give a little extra form. Elbow stopping at about four. for the second arm there. And then the hands go down to the end of five. I'm gonna change the color of our measurement just to make it a little easier to distinguish. So we have red and blue here. I'm also gonna move the figure over a little bit and also shrink it just a touch. This is why measurements are very helpful. So, then we'll go down 
kind of close off the hands, which we can't even see. They're kind of buried in a fashionable amount of cloth. George, I'll just use more of those constructive straight lines. We now want to have that part where the back pops out from the puffy part of the coat. Let's add a little bit of that buff out there. Then we want to go down to where the jacket ends. We're just looking for the termination point of many things. And then we want to know where the leg starts and it ends at about five for this leg, for the half of the knee, the upper part of the leg. And then we have this one, you know, going a little below the knee down to six. I'm going to flip the canvas just to double check here. Always a good move. So right as we said, a little bit down to five, staying very constructive, very simplified, just worrying about measurements and shape and proportion. Getting a little ahead of myself and testing out where that other part of the leg's gonna end, right about seven, which is fine. We wanna draw the stuff that is closer to our view, closer to the viewer. Then we can use that to relate where the other items are gonna end up. Move the body over to give myself a little more room. So right about here is where that knee is gonna come into play. And then down to six. We'll rotate it so that our brain isn't looking at numbers backwards. And then we're going to take this one pretty much down to eight. That very constructive line. We'll just cruise that back up. Do a couple ins and outs as we've done numerous times in assignment demo number one. Get the cuff of the pants just for fun, just to show a little bit more of the termination point. You want to pay attention to termination points in all measurement and just drawing in general. It's going to get rid of some of this because it's confusing the drawing just a touch. Add a little more emphasis of what's in front and what's behind. This is challenging because of the baggy attire. You can definitely do something closer to uh, skin tight or if you are feeling adventurous, more of a nude figure drawing just to test this stuff out. In fact, if you're more of a beginner, I definitely recommend it. Getting the curve of the knee. I'm just gonna go in and kind of demarcate that seam of the pants a little bit just to help pop a little bit more form and dimension in there. We could also do that by just breaking it up with some of those folds. But you see we start very simply, so it's not hard to lay those things in. If you start with all the folds, it's oftentimes very difficult. But we just want those shapes to feel really constructed and solid and like they're interlocking and flowing properly. So next we have the shoes. This shoe stopping at about 8 and this one's stopping at about 8.5 so just pop that out quick just a few succinct lines nothing too fancy just very beginner stuff and just demarcate some of the interior lines there, separate those out. Same with just those little detail inferences, nothing, nothing crazy. And now just for fun, we'll go back and do some of the construction in the face that we kind of skipped over in favor of getting the proportions down of the body. So of course we have that shape of the bangs 
kind of the constructive hair shape. Again, I'm stylizing very straight lines, even where there may not actually be straight lines in the reference, just because it's more constructive and helpful at this phase. You'll find which types of lines you're very attracted to and be able to get very comfortable with those line types and wield them. I just want to demonstrate for you many different types of line and many different approaches so that as you proceed, you can make your own decisions and distinctions when it comes to developing your own style and approach. It's all about the toolbox and the terminology so that you know how these things sort of function and then can begin to elaborate upon them yourself. Quick flip to check the face. Not too shabby. Not perfect, but decent for a demo. I'll get rid of this super obvious line and I'll soften the jaw somewhat because it is a girl after all. I'll correct some of my measurements that I kind of just laid in there, which as you see, since they were succinct and few, was very easy to do. And we're almost finished. You can see how measurement creates a lot more certainty, a lot more certitude, and how it's advantageous to use numerical breakdowns for your reference. And now that you have those numerical breakdowns, you can turn them into their abstractions to understand that if you do a similar pose from a similar perspective, that you now have the measurements for it. It's like understanding the measurements for building a table of a certain type. You can modulate those measurements once you get very comfortable with them, but it's just good to know that information. And really what this course is doing is feeding you that information, allowing you to play with it and understand and learn with it so that you may, as you proceed, figure out how you like to configure it and have your own ways of utilizing it. Right now I'm just getting rid of some of those other shapes that are not going to work well with the overlap of the hair, which again, I'm making very pointy, very constructive. And then this area is a little confusing in terms of overlap. There's a lot of tangents going on. Now I'll explain tangents far more so in lesson nine, but just to give you a brief overview right now, tangents are where lines line up in such a way that things are flattened. You have a lot of coalescence that doesn't create dimension and depth or a feeling of space, as I mentioned in lesson one. You have the opposite. You have a coalescence that flattens things out. So for this portion, I'm just going to shade all this in, create that nice little separation. And these I'm then going to parse out to have a little less of those tangent dangers we were running into before. Like there's some of it going on here. If you squint, which I would encourage you to be doing quite a bit, you'll start to see where things are not dimensional, where things are becoming very homogenized and flat. And that's something to avoid. We want things to look like they're overlapping. We want the proper line weights. We want those little occlusions here and there to help keep things looking believable. It doesn't have to be perfect. There's always going to be some little bits of it, but you want to be on the lookout for it and eliminate it as much as you can. So one more flip and check, and then we'll talk about the last aspects of the demo before we wrap things up here. But yeah, very simplified, but a quite decent demo for understanding how to leverage measurement, how to use more constructive lines, and how to fix stuff later after laying in your initial ideas and measurements. I could mess with this all day, man. Okay.
So let's move some of this on over so that we have room on the picture plane for the other stuff we're going to talk about. This eye is definitely not perfect. I do have to fix that. I have created within myself a deep and abiding um, disdain for inaccuracies in the face as, as much as I can route them and regulate them because you just really don't want to leave mistakes on the canvas. That's something I really want to leave you with. You want to correct as much as you possibly can while you see it. You just don't want to let it remain there and muddy your drawing, muddy your message, sully your technical prowess. Just doesn't make for the most potent art possible. Of course, there is some stuff where you'll forgive it. There's masters that can get away with it, but don't think like that at this stage. Just get your technique down. Be all right with being fastidious and being a little bit picky. All right, that's acceptable. So, as we talked about, we drew lines on shapes, feeling out the forms. We drew through the shapes to get the x-ray structure. We put the shapes on figures and squinted to understand the pose. We applied horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines as a means to measure and correct uh, the proportions. And if you want, you can separate light and shadow out a little bit, which we were doing very slightly with some of this right here, just showcasing what is falling in front and what is falling behind using the weight of lines and some little occlusions. Again, we will cover more of this in the course. Do not worry about it right now if it's you know bothersome to you. It is going to be uh, much more clear as we move forward. So I want you to spend one to four hours a day doing the exercises before moving on to lesson three for about a week. And that pretty much wraps up our assignment for lesson two as far as demonstration purposes go. Again, I'm Taylor Payton, and I want to thank you for grabbing the beginner drawing course. If you are watching this last free assignment demo on YouTube, I highly urge you to get the course. You can check it out in the description box. There is an 8, 12, and 16 week version, and the demonstrations will run up to week eight for now, and then expansions will be free in the future for those who have already purchased the course. Thank you very much, and happy drawing.